Hello, human beings. Power Gamer here. Sorry if I seem a little on edge. It's Halloween tonight, and I'm not very thrilled. Now, don't get me wrong, I normally love Halloween, but I've been having to deal with some pretty crazy stuff the past couple of years. First aliens, then ghosts, so this time, I'm gonna be prepared. There is no way a single monster is gonna get in here, and I've taken the ultimate safety precautions. It's not a full moon, so I shouldn't have to worry about werewolves. I've zombie-proofed the box to keep those walking corpses out of here, and to get rid of the vampires, I'm going to be dressing up as their worst fear. They don't sell any garlic costumes, it was either this or a pickle. Regardless, I've got some sunscreen to ward off the vampires, it's got sun in the name, so they must hate this stuff, and in case of an emergency, I've got my punch popper. Now nothing is gonna stop me from enjoying my Halloween, and to prove it, we're gonna be venturing to one of the most terrifying places on Earth. Tijuana. I think I read that wrong. Castlevania, a classic kick to the groin. One of the most beloved NES games ever made, this game has touched as many hearts as it has broken controllers. The game was developed by Konami, WAIT, and it was directed by Hitoshi Akamatsu, a longtime movie fan who wanted to create a game that made players feel like they were in a classic horror film. The game actually went through quite a number of changes during development. Many of the characters' names were changed, and some things that were planned ended up being cut. It was released for the Famicom Disk System under the title of Akimajo Dracula on September 26, 1986. But when it was localized, the name was changed to Castlevania since the vice president of Konami's American division thought the original title translated to Dracula's Satanic Castle. If you ask me though, that was for the best, since Castlevania is a much cooler name. It was released for the NES in May of 1987 in North America and December of 1988 in Europe. While the game didn't light up sales charts, it was a commercial success as both the original version and its GBA port that was released later on sold a combined total of 1.56 million copies. It got a large amount of critical acclaim when it was released, and even today this game is regarded as as a classic. Castlevania would end up becoming a very successful franchise, spanning a large number of consoles, and it even managed to get an animated series on Netflix, which I haven't watched, but I've heard nothing but high praise. But despite that, the series seems to be pretty much dead, since there hasn't been an original game in almost 10 years. Nice going, guys. I have played this game before, but I was never able to beat it. Aside from that, the only Castlevania game I played is Super Castlevania 4 for the SNES, although I did play the spiritual successor, Bloodstained Curse of the Moon, and both of those were really fun. Nowadays, when people think of Castlevania, they're likely referring to Symphony of the Night for the PS1, or at the very least that style of gameplay, but I think Halloween is the perfect time to take a look back at the original classic and see if it's still worth playing, although I will be giving myself a bit of a break and playing the anniversary collection on the Switch, since I may be patient, but even I have my limits. We're placed in the role of Simon Belmont, a vampire hunter who sets out on a quest to kill the nefarious Count Dracula by invading his castle. Simon's ancestor apparently killed Dracula 100 years ago, but now he suddenly returned and Simon has to deal with him again. We get this really cool opening shot of Simon entering the castle, and now we're good to go. Graphically speaking, the game looks pretty impressive for the NES. It's nothing mind-blowing, but there is a decent amount of detail, and thankfully there isn't that much slowdown. The music is fantastic. The main theme of the game is one of the most iconic songs from the entire NES console, and the rest of the soundtrack is of similar quality. This may seem like a pretty standard side-scroller, but it's actually pretty unique. For starters, it's not entirely linear. Most games of the time would just have you going to the right, but here you're moving in all sorts of directions. It doesn't really affect the gameplay that much, but it does help the castle feel a bit more cohesive. Although I do question some parts of the layout. There's a bunch of platforms and staircases that go absolutely nowhere. Is it because the castle's falling apart, or did it always look this way? Because if that's the case, the architect must have been really tipsy. Another thing that makes this game unique is the weapon. Instead of a sword or a gun, Simon uses his trusty whip, which I don't think was done at the time. The whip starts out really short, but you can find these extensions that make it longer. You get them almost immediately, but if you die, the whip resets and you have to grab them again. It's not hard to do so, but it can get a little annoying. The castle is filled with monsters, and most of them die in just a couple of hits. The whip is honestly a pretty efficient weapon, and it can be really fun to use. The only downside is you can only whip directly in front of you. You can't go up or down. But the whip isn't your only form of defense. You can obtain a plethora of sub-weapons to help you out as well. By whipping these candles, you can occasionally find extra weapons and hearts which you use as ammo. Kinda weird that the hearts don't restore your health. You can only do that by finding these pork chops in the walls, don't question it. Use the sub-weapons by holding up and pressing the attack button. There's the dagger, which you throw at enemies, the axe, which you lob in the air, the stopwatch, which freezes enemies for a few seconds, the holy water, which creates a small flame on the ground, and my personal favorite, the cross, which you throw like a boomerang. There's also the crucifix, which instantly kills every enemy on screen, and the pitcher, which makes you invincible, but those are pretty rare. You'll mostly find them in these candles, but you'll sometimes get them from defeated enemies. If you die, you lose your sub-weapon, and your heart count resets to 
cost only five. Most of the items only cost one heart to use, except for the cross and stopwatch, which cost five. I really like the sub-weapons in this game. Almost all of them are useful in some way, and they add quite a bit of variety. The weakest one is definitely the dagger, but it's still somewhat useful. You can only throw one weapon at a time, unless you find these Roman numerals that let you use two or three. While Simon may be really good at fighting, his platforming skills leave a lot to be desired. The most common complaint people have with this game is the controls, and I totally agree. They're not horrible, but they are really sluggish. Unlike most platformers, Simon can't control himself in mid-air. When you jump, you are locked into whichever direction you're going. You don't gain any momentum either, so making a jump is all about distance, and it's fairly common to just barely undershoot it. This game is insanely hard, and 90% of the challenge comes from the vast assortment of pits everywhere. Not only do you have to worry about jumping, but this game has a sizable amount of knockback, so if an enemy hits you when you're near a pit, you're screwed. Not to mention, so many of these enemies are really freaking annoying. Most of them aren't that bad, but some can just piss right off. The hunchbacks jump around all over the place, and they are so freaking fast, it's nearly impossible to hit them without the holy water. And even worse, later levels have these birds that drop them infinitely. Screw you. These knights throw axes at you and take nine hits to kill, which can be miserable, but the worst ones are by far the Medusa heads. They fly across the screen, and killing them doesn't matter because they respawn infinitely until you get past a certain point. If that wasn't bad enough, you almost always run into them when you're near a pit, so prepare for these things to knock you back. A lot. The game is separated into six areas with 18 levels total. Every time you die, you go back to the start of the level, and if you lose all your lives, you go back to the start of the area. Each area ends with a boss fight, and beating it is essentially a checkpoint, although the level doesn't end until you grab this orb that appears for some reason. Thankfully, you have unlimited continues, but going back to all these levels can be really frustrating, unless you're playing the anniversary collection, which lets you use save states. Yes, that is why I'm playing this version, and no, I don't care. This game is hard as hell, and these very easily save me multiple hours of my time. What was that? Out of this box! Out of this box! We have a decent variety of rooms to go through. You start outside, and the first area is pretty basic, but you do go down into the basement, which is kinda neat. The first boss is a giant bat, which just flies around. It's fairly easy. The next area is where the game shows its true colors, particularly this room where you have to jump over pits while avoiding Medusa heads. Crap, 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 crap. Also watch out for these spike things, because they kill you instantly. The boss is Medusa, as in the full one this time. She floats around and drops snakes. It's not that hard. Funny, the smaller version is substantially more annoying. Now we're after exploring some weird architecture we have to fight two mummies. They don't really do much aside from walking back and forth and shooting cloth at you. Then you fall down into the catacombs, and this is where the game really starts to get hard. Because from this point on, every single enemy you run into takes a quarter of your life in damage, so you can only afford to get hit four times. This might be more manageable if it wasn't for how uncommon pork chops are, and here you have to deal with these fire snakes on the wall that take so many hits to kill. The next boss is the Frankenstein monster, and a hunchback that I assume is supposed to be Igor. Honestly, Igor is the real boss, since he jumps all over the place and shoots fireballs at you. All Frankie does is walk back and forth. And the next area is without a doubt the worst part of the game. You have to walk down this hallway fighting two knights as two sets of Medusa heads come flying at you from both directions. It is absolutely insane unless you get the stopwatch. Oh, hell yeah! But even when you make it through that, you have to fight the Grim Reaper. Screw this stupid Deathbringer in a burlap sack! This is easily the most frustrating boss fight. He floats around and summons up to four sites. He doesn't throw them. He summons them out of nowhere. And they don't disappear. They continuously follow you until you either attack them or they somehow go off screen. But when they do, he just summons more! This fight is not fair or fun at all. Wait, what? Huh? <sighs> Great. The game froze. Thank you, safe dance. There are many moments where I swear it is impossible to avoid getting hit. And you might die in four hits, but he takes 16! Are you kidding me?! And the stopwatch doesn't even work here, that's just great! Come on, come on, just a couple more hits and I- YES! NO! NO! YOU GOTTA BE KIDDING ME! I HAD THAT! I FREAKING HAD THAT! HE WAS DEAD! BUT THE SCYTHE HIT ME BEFORE I COULD GRAB THE ORB! OH, COME ON! Stupid thing! I hate this, 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 I one How did I win? Seriously, how did I just win? I randomly did more damage than before. Huh. You know what? I'm not gonna complain. I spent an hour fighting that stupid thing, and that was with save states. Without save states, I don't even wanna think about how long that would have taken. 
Now that that's over, we get an incredibly annoying jumping trial with giant bats knocking you off and then swarms of birds jumping hunchbacks. This is ridiculous. How am I supposed to keep up with this? When you finally reach the end, you're gonna want to farm hearts so you have as much weapon use as possible. The game even gives you the choice of the cross and the holy water. That's nice. Personally, I took the cross. Now we finally come face to face with Dracula. He teleports, opens his cape, and shoots fireballs before disappearing. His only weak spot is the head, and you're gonna want to jump right as he shoots the fireballs. The timing is really specific, but you should get the pattern down after a while. This would be a really fun fight if it wasn't for the fact that wherever he appears is completely random! If he appears on top of you, damage is unavoidable. You do have a couple of seconds to react, but unless you time it perfectly, you do not move fast enough to get out of the way. But that's only the first phase. Once you beat him, his head flies off and he turns into this unholy monstrosity. Again, his only weak point is the face. This is where the cross really comes in handy. He jumps and shoots fireballs. I swear it is impossible to run underneath him, so if you don't hit him fast enough or avoid the fire, you're not gonna win. And the worst part is that all of this is done without health restoration. If you take four hits on either of these things, you're dead. This could have been a really cool final boss, but it just ends up being unfairly brutal. And it's still not as bad as the Grim Reaper. If you actually manage to kill him, Dracula's castle crumbles and the credits roll with each person listed being a slightly different name of a real person connected to Dracula or other classic monsters. After that, you can replay the game in hard mode. No thanks. Seriously, what was that? I completely monster-proof this place! I prepared for vampires, werewolves, demons, ghosts, witches, aliens, zombies? What could I have possibly forgotten? What could that have been? Think, 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 think! Wait a minute. I know what I forgot. The true monster of Castlevania! The most important element of the series! And it took my game. But I know how to get it back. We're gonna catch that monster using the one thing it can't resist. Sunscreen. These things eat the stuff up like candy. Now all I have to do is wait here and I'll have that thing in no time. Huh. Well, oh, that was quicker than expected. Dang it, it was just a bear. Huh. What do you know? I guess that was what took the game. Hm. Could have sworn it was something else. Hm. Thought I heard something. Hm. Felt like there was gonna be something behind me. Wait, why was I going this way again? Oh right, I need to get back to my box to conquer the game. Oh, wait, I forgot to grab my sunscreen again. <laughs> I knew it, the one true monster of the Castlevania series. The castle. Uh, I gotta go! <laughs> oh, this is bad, this is bad, this is bad, 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 bad. What do I do? What do I do? What do I do? Wait, put it out. Go left. Oh, there's no way that thing's gonna find me over here. <laughs> what do I do? Come on, think, think, think. Let's see. Vampires are weak to sun, witches are weak to water, zombies are weak to signs. What are castles weak to? Wait, I got it. The castle's true weakness: brute force. Suck this, you bag of bricks. have to be so messy.
fun, but it is also really hard. It's not as challenging as something like Zelda 2 or Super Meat Boy, but it can be really frustrating, even though there aren't many parts of this game that are really satisfying to beat. I say you be the judge on whether or not you should play this game, but if you're hesitant, at least try it on the Anniversary Collection, because that way you can save yourself some time and some headaches. Also, remember to lock your doors at night. You don't want a castle following you home. Most insurance companies don't cover that.